the image was not good enough to send to her. Okay. Yeah. I need to interrupt you because we are live streaming now. Um, apologies for anyone who was waiting for the video. We had multiple technical difficulties as you do. I've done this like so many times now and still things don't work as you planned. Um, so I'm not going to talk for too long because we've already lost some time. I do just want to thank Gina and Erla so much for coming online to participate in this conversation. Erla's in Berlin and Gina's in Harare. And Charlene Khan, who is an artist and academic. She's based in Johannesburg and she'll be moderating the conversation um, once I sign off. And uh, Charlene is a little bit special because she also had um, an artist residency at the bag factory in 2002 for three months. So I think she speaks from some personal experiences as well when she leads this conversation. Um, I just want to thank the funders who have made the residencies possible. Unfortunately, Andreas is not able to join us for the conversation because he's been quite unwell uh, back in Sweden. So we wish him a speedy recovery and we hope to see what he's been working on when he is feeling a little bit better to share with us. So thank you, ladies. I'm going to sign off my video and leave the conversation to you to continue. Thanks, Candice. Well, thank, thank you very much, Candice, uh, for that. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to moderate uh, this discussion between Georgina and Erla. Um, and um, a big shout out to Andres, who's not well and not able to join this discussion today. Um, and as you've mentioned, uh, the bag factory is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've, um, uh, it, is, it opened up Johannesburg as a space to me as a young artist uh, when I went on the residency there in 2002. And I know what a special community of artists um, that uh, is and was, um, in particular, um, you know, Uncle Pat and Uncle Dave, um, uh, who have been, you know, lifelong mentors since then, um, and Uncle Dave, who's, who's sorely missed. And so um, I, I know what a special, you know, place that has been, you know, for the, for the last uh, 20 years uh, in my life and what an impact that three-month residency had for me. So uh, it's fantastic to host this conversation. Um, and a little bittersweet for, for the artists who um, had to, to leave uh, because of the COVID uh, situation. Um, but I am looking forward to this discussion. And um, so let's just jump into it. Um, uh, I must say I do enjoy uh, discussions with women artists. Um, so as much as we miss Andreas, <laughs> it does give us <laughs> an opportunity to have a, a discussion among women. Um, yeah. So yeah. So 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 let's so let's get into that a little bit. Um, and so let's start off with the with the question for for Erla. Erla. Where have all the unicorns gone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the yeah, <clears throat> the unicorns. Um, yeah, they. It's like this fantastic mythical creature. I find it to be such a, you know, humorous kind of mix between fiction and uh, reality, like, um, and. Um, I mean, I was fascinated with unicorn. Like, of course, as a as a kid and as a little girl, I would be like, my dream would be to to actually see a real unicorn, and um, uh, yeah, I, I guess you referred to my painting of the unicorn, uh, which was uh, uh, shown in this cathedral in Lund, um, and it's actually referring to. Um, like um, choir uh, stools that are in the back, which are in the in the cathedral, that are like it's like carved wood, and there is all these like fabulous animals that are um, carved in there. 
so um and this particular unicorn is like um it's it's um icelandic horse with a horn and um i put it kind of like low in the space because i wanted the the visitors to kind of like come up close to it and you know this the unicorn for me it's this mythical creature that's like hiding and not really you can't really see it up close so that's what the, was the idea with this painting um, georgina you also seem to in some of your work um access childhood and oral stories as well um, can you speak to some of that? Um, hello, everyone. I think uh, the first thing that I could try to put across in uh, my work is about the memory that I try to extend and preserve, if I could say those two words, extension and prevent, uh, pres preservation of uh, memory. Um, I see we are all looking at garden. Um, which uh, is an old dress um, that I used to wear as well, uh, which forms the background of, of uh, the work. And then uh, there are so many other pieces that are sewn on top of that. But yeah, there they is something that continues to uh, disturb me, if I can say it quite honestly. Um, that there is someone that I continue to search for and that particular person, I will never be able to see them. Uh, so there's that trying to balance between the memory and preservation of something that, that I had and I want to continue to, to have it for as long as possible. Um, because I fear that sometimes you need somebody to remind you of that memory and, and then you go, oh yes, I remember that. And yet... With me, it's not about having to be reminded, but to constantly have it with me all the time. So the uh, preservation becomes such a, uh, an interesting fact. Uh, I see we are now looking at uh, licorice tero. It's, tero is a Shona word um, for a winnowing basket. And um, that's basically a, a lace skirt that I, I got from uh, my sister. She used to wear it. Uh, with so much pride and, and she would look quite, quite, uh, quite beautiful in it. And then, but if you look inside the, or behind that lace, the black lace, um, there's the red uh, uh, color that's coming through. There are a lot of writings at the back there. And the writings are sort of coming from letters, um, uh, times that I used to remember when I was a child, um, and also things that my sister and I could probably remind each other of how we used to grow up and become um, and, and, and relate to, to what we do now today. So, yeah, it's, it, it's memory and preservation. It's the two things that I try to, to work with mostly. Yeah. So, Georgina, you've, you use a combination of stitching, knitting, weaving and applique in your work. And you've mm -hmm. studied both visual arts and design. Can you speak to the kind of creative background you've had and how this has influenced your process? Um, well, there's the known fact that when I was at uh, Chinoy uh, University here in Zimbabwe, that there was a, I was a, I was majoring in painting and I had two minors in uh, textile design and drawing. Um, and surprisingly. I tried my hand out in, in painting and then got married to a painter and then <laughs> that <laughs> definitely did not work out. So I took some time to find a way to speak the things that continued to circle around me uh, to the point that during those years I was working at a very fantastic space called Gallery Delta for about 13 to 14 years and at the same time I was teaching um uh, art at the same time and from from always spending your time at a gallery um and seeing every single day uh, a different kind of artwork that some other artist was bringing and if if they didn't bring it then it was on the walls and it was information that was readily available without even asking the artist what they were doing um i then remember that 
there is still something that I would like to say. So in returning home um, and visiting my, my, my good aunt, uh, there was a suitcase that I saw and I, I asked upon it and I said, what is in there? And only to find out that there were still some other clothes that were remaining of our grandmother. And from then, I think it was the idea of defying what tradition says about um, clothes of a deceased person, that they should be worn until they, they are in tatters and they should be discarded. Uh, you should let go of them. But for me, it was trying to defy that by keeping, keeping them as long as I could. And that's how it started, uh, remembering how my grandmother used to knit the same way that I do, sewing, crocheting, doing applique, and also including a bit of weaving into my work as well. So that was the combination that, I think that whole combination informed uh, how I decided to start working with textile and mixed media textiles. But the training had always been there. Painting is good. It gives you a lot of understanding in color. It makes you wander around uh, and appreciate what color comes after or what needs to be um, done in a circular or triangular formation. But yeah, the background was there, but then re seeing those clothes informed what I needed to, to start doing all over again. Yeah. But I didn't stop drawing. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll return to these thoughts in, in a little bit. Um, okay. Erla, um, Erla, you started off as a, as a realistic painter um, and you were particularly interested in portraits. Um, then you stopped painting for a period of around 10 to 15 years and you worked with digital photo montages and video in collaborative uh, works. Uh, and these works were around your home city as a very monocultural environment. Tell us a little bit about these works and how you, how you found your way back to painting again. Is Orla still with us? Yeah, I was about to ask that. Oh, sorry, <laughs> excuse me. I was muting myself before. Yeah, the works that the photo montages, it's um, like kind of pan panoramic images of, for instance, Reykjavik, which um, it's like, it's kind of a Photoshop from hell. It's, it's, um, it's like <clears throat> the images are from Reykjavik and then it's a collaborative work um, with a Swedish artist, Bo Mellin. And uh, we were putting in these um, um, like trash and uh, graffiti and the, like uh, loose elements that you would find in in larger uh, multicultural cities like for instance I, I was living in San Francisco for a while and I was living very close to Chinatown and what struck me was that what made Chinatown Chinatown was all like the loose elements um, the banners and while the architecture was the same uh, so that's what I that's what we wanted to do with Reykjavik was to 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 create this different kind of like a, like <clears throat> like a Chinatown in one part and then it was more um, one part was was resembling a little bit of the Turkish areas in Berlin and so forth but um, if, if you wouldn't have been to Reykjavik and never you know you wouldn't really see that there was it was like hard to see that it, this was a photo montage going on and uh, yeah so I was I was doing this for for several years and also along with video works that were anim with animations uh, with in it and um, um, and then I simply you know I felt all of a sudden uh, like a big longing to start working with my hands again, like to make things, to paint, because this sitting in front of the computer was just not really um, my cup of tea any longer. So um, that's how I found myself back to painting. And, um, uh, but I, I took with me the knowledge I had from, from all the digital works, I took it with me into the painting. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, 
And um, in terms of, um, I want to pick up with, with where Georgina left um, in terms of, of these, the, the state of the personal, um, because that is a little bit of an element that both of your works share. Um, so with you, Georgina, using the garments of, of, of close relatives um, and friends, um, and then you, you, you sew into, into these, um, and, and it's quite layered the kinds of stitches and the kinds of materialities that you're using. Um, and um, uh, um, Erla, you, there's, there's a, quite a few series um, where, you, where you're dealing with uh, family, with painting family and with relationships of intimacy. Um, can, can both of you speak to this element of the personal in your work? Um. Uh, should I start? Or? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. You can start. Yeah. Um, for instance, this this work, what we see now, it's um, uh, portraits of my uh, my close friends and colleagues from the time. This is really old works. It's from 1996, and um, um, I think what I was doing it was like some kind of a giant self portrait almost. Uh, um, also, it was a way to learn to know. Um, I wanted to add some kind of something that wasn't really in the photograph. Um, because at, in those times, if you're going to talk about painting, um, it was kind of almost uh, paintings was considered to be to be dead. This is like when I was studying um, in the 90s and I was like sneaking, sneaking to paint. Uh, and it was just um, something that I would do on the side and I was never really meaning to to um, to actually show it and then it just came you know it became this portrait gallery in the end and uh, um, uh, and when it comes to other paintings uh, of my uh, like that are made from old photographs, white and black and white photographs of old relatives, like uh, um, from my family albums of like relatives, um, great grandmother, great great grandmother um, photographs that are were took maybe around 1900. It was a way for me to paint them. Was a way for me to kind of learn to know them better. Um, yeah. So it was it's very, per it was like I, I wanted to learn to know these women and by painting them, it was a way to, to get close to them and to learn to know them somehow, yeah. Okay, so for me, um, I think uh, if we look at uh, the year 2018, 2019, um, oh yeah, Candice, if you can find, um, if you can see that image, the next one, no, the following one. Yeah. Uh, no, Candice, <laughs> you're going too fast. Um, it's supposed to be Mingo, the one that looks like an adventure time, like a cartoon character with uh, the one before. Before that? Yeah, that one. Maybe I could use that exactly because I was beginning to speak about... Uh, the years of 20, 2017, actually, uh, I was doing a residency in uh, Geneva and I wanted to work with a certain kind of theme that, that still to today it, it feels like I've not really exhausted it, but I've just only put it on the side. Um, that theme uh, was, um, I, I called it healing through stitches. Um, and the stitches for me, I defined, it, I defined them in, in three things, three ways of stitches. Well, the first one was the common, the common stitches that I use, which are sewing stitches, knitting stitches, um, and, and how people try to heal a certain garment um, by putting stitches on it. You tear a dress and you still want to wear it, regardless of how bad the, the, it's torn. Then you, you stitch it up, so you've healed it. And then there's the stitches where that statement, a very English statement that says, I was in stitches of laughter and how everybody says laughter is the best medicine. 
So medicine for what? You, you, you feel unwell, you feel down, you feel empty. And if somebody gives you laughter, then some of these things seem to, to disappear. And then the last one was healing through stitches again, which is stitches of scars, scars and cicatrices, where someone goes through a very bad injury and they have only the, the scars and the stitches to show that, uh, you know, I was in a very bad um, um, accident. I don't want to make it sound so grim, but I was in a very bad accident. And this, these are the stitches to show my, my part of healing and the pro- process of that. So when, when that continued to circle around me, healing through st- stitches, it became extremely personal because there are some things that we all wish and intend to heal from. Loss being the very first thing that everybody wishes to heal from and as quickly as possible. And for me, I decided it would be a good way to sit and, 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 um, and, and continue to do this, this uh, way of, of making artworks. So right now we're looking at Mingo. Uh, Mingo is a Shona word. I like to uh, use Shona words in my, in my artworks because they have a deeper uh, meaning to to everybody else, to me, to all those that understand it. And Mingo is a is a baby carrier, uh, the very most traditional one, where you strap your ba- the baby on your back, and everybody has used it. I don't know now in these modern times if people continue to use this quite traditional one. And it used to be white in color, um, and it still remains as white with a very strong um, material. Um, that they use for it. So with this one, it was Mingo, when you come back, carry me. It's just a wish to be, to be a, a child again, to, to be carried around and to have adventure times and to just allow whoever is carrying me to walk around and I see everything at a different kind of level uh, and, and to just feel like, you know what? It's okay. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, can have, you can have fun on my back and I can carry you around and, and yeah, so it becomes, as, as I continue with the years, because look at that one, it's a 2017 artwork, and I continue with the years, and the work still remains very, very personal. It, 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 it answers to many other people who, who speak to me, and I try to describe the work, and they, they relate to some of these things very, very well. So I hope I've answered that question, yeah. You know, the artist, uh, South African artist, Senzeni Mahasela says, you know, this adulting thing is not fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, it's not. <laughs> um, but it, I mean, it also starts, you know, when you say that, you know, there's a baby, it, it, the, the, baby, the baby carrier is the base of this, you know. Um, it also mm-hmm. takes on like sort of sinister tones because it reminds me of the Toni Morrison novel, Beloved, where... Mm. Um, the main character has has uh, you know when when they uh, she's she's a ex slave and when and and when when they when she's run away from slavery and they they've come to 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 take her back she she kills one of her children and oh. this and the rather than rather than let her children go back into slavery and mm. in the, in the part of the book. One of the go, one of the children that she's killed basically returns as a ghost, basically, mm. and and haunts and haunts her house, and it's a spiteful ghost that wants mm. its mother's love, basically. So, you know, it 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 it, it has the, it it can take on a very sinister tones as well. So, I, I think that's quite interesting. But maybe a follow-up question would be, what 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 are you hearing from? What are the <laughs> it always happens that people want to ask me that particular question. Uh, what am I healing yeah. from? I think the first I thing mean, is are, loss. Are they just individual, or just are they just individual, or or are they also collective traumas as well? Um, I think let me let me take them as both because what what we have lost was a was a. Uh, was a, a very important person uh, in our lives. And, um, and I think I, I, I probably am the one who's taking it much deeper than everybody else. And everybody else has taken up um, a better stance to it. 
But remember what I said in the beginning that I'm, I'm in search of someone um, and that person I, I know I'll never, uh, I'll never see them. And that is my mother. So that's, that's the loss, the, the loss that I, 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 I continue to struggle from. I never met her. Uh, she passed on from complications from birth. And then, then I, I, I grew up with my grandfather and my grandmother and I, I held on to them very, very dearly because they, they were the ones that uh, were supposed to replace this, this uh, particular person. And then I lost them again. So, you know, it, it, it's loss that I try to, to, to heal from. And I know we can never run away from it. You know, life is, 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 is life. And everybody has got their own, uh, should I call it expiry date? And we should all embrace it. But uh, I think um, eventually, eventually, somehow. I, I did an exhibition uh, at the ACA uh, last year. I titled it, Your Parents Are So Old. Um, because I've just come to a realization that even if I continue to say I want my parents back and I want them to be here, which are these two, my grandmother and my grandfather, really, I'm being selfish because even if I want them to come back today, they're going to be quite old. And it's, it's, it's a huge burden for them at the moment just to look at what kind of age they would be. You, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to be burdening them. So let them rest in, in eternal peace. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. Because I think, you know, that's, that's not something that, that we talk about often enough. And, you know, mm. having lost my, my parents, both my parents in the last um, uh, four years, um, it's it's something life and education never prepares you for, no. and and it's something that I that I speak to uh, about with my students, mm. and 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 the fact that we all have to go through this, but when the center of your of your life is a, is extinguished and you have to and you have to reorientate yourself, yeah. and you've never been prepared for that. Um, mm. and, and, and so we're all suffering, you know, in, the sec in some part of our life with reorientating ourselves. But there's nothing mm. in our education system that allows that us to us. think through this. Yeah. Mm. And, mm. And, and so, you know, to, to be able to have artworks and creative works and people who speak about this is mm. incredibly important. So thank you for that. You're um, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. So, so uh, so Erla, tell us a little bit about, um, because I was also quite intrigued with your work around, around um, Turf House. Mm, yeah, actually, you know, I want to just reconnect a little bit to, we don't have these works here, but I made a, a huge exhibition last year with portraits of my female ancestors on my father's side. And now, Gina, you're talking about the loss of your mother. And it's because I've never really been talking about, the, but the whole work, uh, Patterns of the Family, is actually coming from a loss of my father. He mm. died, he passed away, like, just suddenly. And it left me with all these photos. I, mm. I, he, I had, like, a back box with photos from, like, that I could look at. So it was, so that generated that specific work. Um, of these uh, ancestors on my father's side because he was very, very close to them. And yeah, so the turf house, um, to, to reconnect to, to that. Um, but babe, maybe, uh, uh, maybe uh, Erla, before you even go to the turf house, maybe you can also tell yeah. us how, because your father was half American, as you, you said, how he also influenced your ideas around um, different cultures. Yeah, like my father, he was, um, uh, his, his father was an American soldier in Iceland during the World War II, because in Iceland there were all these, there were like um, 50,000 American soldiers. Um, and um, so my grandmother, uh, had had this uh, romance with one of them and uh, my father became pregnant and that was a scandal in in the small Icelandic society and uh, and my father he was uh, he was a, he was like you would see that he was not Icelandic he was dark he had like dark hair and um, 
uh, and he he uh, he was never <clears throat> yeah he moved to california when when my my parents divorced like when he was in his early 30s and he he always felt um like he didn't belong in iceland because he was different and he was being like people would look at him like he was just um yeah, he was like actually really bullied when he was a child. I mean, uh, because of this, and this is the thing, this is how it, because there were a lot of children that, a lot of war babies, and they were all kind of the women that had babies with, with the American soldiers, they were all considered to be, you know, like sluts. So, um, and that was like also something that was never really discussed. And it's just quite recently, this is discussed in Iceland and there are like, people writing about it, writing PhDs about this. And, but it was like such a huge shame thing on the whole, on the whole society. But um, uh, so I think my, my, my work with here, there and everywhere, the photo montages of, of, the, of, of Reykjavik turned into like a larger, play, like a more cross-cultural place has to do with that. And also many of my works are kind of, where I'm mixing, I'm mixing different um, symbols, um, um, relig like like pattern, like I don't know how to, yeah, like also it has to do with hierarchy somehow. Uh, but um, since we don't have it here in front of us, it's difficult to explain it. But um, maybe I should talk about this turf house. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, this is, um, uh, Iceland used to be um, a colony. It was uh, under Denmark and, um, and it was in, in the end of the World War II, we became independent. So Iceland, Icelanders were like really, really poor and living in turf houses, like 90% <clears throat> were living in, in these houses until actually the last people, um, I mean, they were living in them until the 50s uh, or 40s 50s and um, these are like houses that are built of of turf and my grandmother great grandmother uh, she was born in one of those and um, it would be extremely cold in the winters and the children would um, would sleep next to the animals um, to keep warm and this is something that my grandma great grandmother she was very ashamed of this being so poor and um, but now it's what's what's like you, so this is something that you know I remember these stories from her and from my my grandmother but now it's just like another story going on like now the, these are more considered to be uh, ecological and it's like a tourist attraction and um, Yes, yeah, so like the Icelanders, the, the older generations of Icelanders see this much differently than, you know, the younger or the, the tourists to see this as something that's like cute, like hobbit houses or something. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I find that to be, um, you know, interesting. Like that, that's what was my idea with this painting and also it has like a large door format it's it's like it's like i was thinking of it as a as a portal like you you walk into it and uh, uh yeah so so that was the i wanted to to give that to have this like feeling of you could actually walk into into this place um it also has to do with like there's, there's uh, always, you know, all the, these stories you hear from your, your family, it's like a mystery surrounding, it's like a mystery and you, you want to, you know, I've always been kind of fascinated by um, like imagining how it would be, how it was in those times, how it would be to live in, in a place, in a turf house. So that's like where the idea from this painting came. So I hope I could answer. <laughs> Thanks. That's um, I'm a huge, I'm a huge, I'm a huge uh, Tolkien fan. So I'm a huge fan of Hobbit houses. <laughs> um, so I should check this out anytime I come to Iceland. Yeah. Um, but you don't like being faced with blank canvas, and so you've part of your your 
you, you found inspiration in the instructional arts of the 60s as a means of initiating your process. Can you tell us about um, your, your process that involves uh, getting tasks uh, from other people? And so who gets to give you a task? And, and can you tell us about this process? Um, yeah, it's like the process is uh, actually, this is a way for me to, to really combat procrastination. It's a way to, um, to um, how can I, I don't know how to put it. It's like a way to get to work, um, to be the creator of my own system instead of waiting for someone else to give me a task or no, I, um, how can I, yeah, it's like, a, it's, it, it, I've always had like this thing where it's, it's like, you know, I don't want to be waiting for the perfect divine idea to come to me. I, I would, I, I rather want to get to work and then I get into a process and then the ideas uh, kind of come in the process. So from the beginning, this like, um, uh, this with the instruction is a way to, um, to get into a process and, um, I mean, there are many of these artists from the 60s that were working in that way. For instance, Yoko Ono with her like poetic, uh, these uh, re instructions um, she was giving to herself. And, um, and the, the, this uh, also it, it comes from um, the ideas kind of deriving from this uh, French literary group called Olipo. They were... Um, created in uh, like it was a group of mathematicians and uh, poets and uh, artists uh, not artists actually writers mm -hmm. um, in like from 60s and um, they came up with simple like with different sy systems in order to write uh, fiction uh, poetry and fiction and um, so yeah, it was just, uh, that was just some, somehow uh, put into how to make art instead, like, um, and um, um, so these tasks, uh, I, I was like, when I, after my, like, 15 year of passing with painting, I started out with, with, um, um, giving these workshops and how to make art and then uh, it just develops from that to to using these methods in uh, collaborations with other artists so many of these paintings are made from tasks from other artists and also actually tasks that I give to myself so I, I'm still working in this manner <clears throat> and, and part I of this is the fact and the part of this is the fact that you even have the space that you are going to exhibit finally yeah. already in mind. Yeah, like like a use creating, like right. Yeah, so the the space where I exhibit, I, I use that as like um, how would I put it? Like um, like a dialogue or like a space, like a place to to gravitate towards or or as yeah. So it's the space, and and then there like yeah the space is really important actually and then there is also um instructions you know or constraints behind the paintings it, it can be tasks it can also be like like size and what's what's the content of them and uh, yeah um, i i work a lot with size like <laughs> The size of the painting, the the mesh, mm -hmm. like like the, yeah. Um, mm. Thank you, yeah. Regina. Yes. I I work a, I work a lot with um with uh, with textile with sewing and embroidery and I do needle lace, but which is very time consuming. Oh, but yes. I, I have I have to say you know like. Looking at your work, I, I, even I am bowled over, uh, and <laughs> the fact that you know when you when you realize that every single one of those stitches 
is made by by you hand. every single <laughs> one by so my question to you is why this laborious time consuming <laughs> process is it a labor of love is it a gesture <laughs> of love is it a form of madness <laughs> I knew someone I knew that word was going to come because I've been asked so many questions about is it a moment uh, of of madness what 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 really is involved with every single stitch <laughs> I, oh wow <laughs> um I think that's just how it is <laughs> that's just how it is there's there is no other way for me to do it other than stitching it. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, yeah. because in my process, there's every moment where I'm like, you know what? Why this. am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think I've, I've said that but, so many times. It's so. No, tiring. I've heard you. You said, no, no, no. I've heard you. You are like, you are like no, no, no. No handmade, no machine work. Machine work no. is cheating. So you love the stuff, Jenna. I do actually. I really do. It's the it's when when I begin in a work, it's the the toughest. It's the toughest of them all because it's uh, in two hours I've done just just the size of a book, but. <laughs> <laughs> Ella is laughing, yeah. Uh, but once the groove, the process begins, it becomes so. Um, I think I become like a like a like a machine. Uh, one stitch after the other, after the other, after that. I've got uh, over. I think I've got now maybe twenty needles. Um, that vary in sizes, but must all have the same hole at the end. And I thread them all. And when I finish those 20, I, I look at the time and I'm, 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 I, I'm surprised that time has just gone past. But the space that I've done is, is so small. But I think over the years, I've come up with a, with a, a, a good way of becoming more quicker um because now it is easier it i found i find that it's easier to try and do small uh, uh panels if i can call them or pieces cut it up again cut up the the work and then do the pieces and then rejoin them in that way it doesn't become too too tiring for me but sometimes i don't even notice that it's 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 this tiring but yeah I, I know, I know. That question is always coming. Why, why, why would you bother with all these million stitches uh, rather really than finding it? There's a, there's a, there's a certain uh, type statement that I'm going to use, which is alone but lonely. Um, and I, I look forward to that. I look forward to that particular moment when I'm alone but not lonely. Um, and and yes, maybe there is some sort of madness in it because that's the backside that uh, the detail of a work in progress. Uh, what is shown at the front is totally something else, and what is at the back is another whole thing together. <laughs> that's so, beautiful. Yeah, so maybe it is a it's time of it's a time of madness, maybe. <laughs> if I can You're say welcome. that. <laughs> You've also spoken about the monotony of the stitch. Um, what do you mean by that? And, and how does that help you to access memory? Okay, so um, the, the stitch uh, remains the same. What then makes it different is the thread uh, and the needle um, and probably the surface that I'm working on uh, makes it totally different. But uh, when I say the monotony, it's because it's the same action of going in and out and up and in and out. It's, it's so monotonous. But what makes it so, so different is when I have to remember the, the cloth because I then cut the cloth into smaller pieces that I then up, uh, apply on top. 
and and I have to remember not to do the same cloth over and over again, even though sometimes it is intentional. But when I'm looking for lots of color uh, and, and different kind of texture, then monotony kind of stops. I, I'm, I'm also reminded that I have to come back uh, to the space that I'm, or at the time that I'm working at. When, when I prick myself with the needle, it's, it's the most sharp and painful process, but it happens so often. And then uh, I look at my nails sometimes and they're the worst things to look at. Um, and so these days I try to, uh, you know, paint them, make them look better, look at them and, and be okay with it, <laughs> you know? It's, yeah, it comes with damages, you know, this, this whole sewing thing. It comes with a lot of damages. You can be, you can try to sit with other people, but then they can be quite annoying and you move away from them. And yet you can sit with people and, 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 and sew and, and just do it. But then it's a balance. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but yeah, it, there's, yeah, yeah. there's some things that, that do happen when, when I'm sewing by myself. It's, it's quite nice. It's a, it's a time I look forward to, actually. Yeah. So, so how, do you, how, how do you decide uh, what the final form will take? Ooh, um, because everything is coming from a, a female garment, uh, and I, I, I mentioned female garment in all aspects. I've used even panties and I've even used bras. I've used petticoats. I've used uh, maids uniforms. I've used uh, nighties. I've used blouses, skirts, anything that is a female garment. But the fact that I don't want it to continue to remain at the same kind of memory. Remember, it's, a, uh, it's an extension and a preservation. Um, then I try to, to enjoy the shape. I try to play with the with different kind of shapes that are emanating from that particular garment. I think it becomes boring if it remains a blouse as a blouse or a dress as a dress. Uh, but it becomes more interesting if if you play with the shape and try to create a new shape altogether. And then, yeah, it's it's also quite fun to cut them up and and create something new out of that. It is quite quite good to do that. Yeah. So uh, just an extension of that, can you tell us a little bit about that series you did with aprons and how it embodied the contradiction of expectations placed on women? Um, there were 10, um, 10 of these uh, aprons that I worked firstly with weaving. Um, I, I, took, I took the idea from a doormat, uh, which is something that is very common. I think everywhere, everybody's got a doormat, but there's a certain kind of doormat that I, I followed and tried to copy from. And that doormat um, is out of uh, discarded pieces and there's a, a certain um, uh, religious sect in this country that, which are the apostles who, kind of, who make these uh, for a for a living, so I took I took that that format uh, format and and decided to work with the first I think the first one being the yellow one, and then a, a black one, and then the most colorful one, which were the three out of the ten, and I called them uh, the cook the doormat. <laughs> it got me <laughs> got me into a bit of trouble with uh, other people who didn't take it lightly. They didn't find the, the truthness in it. They felt offended by it. Um, but it was me trying to tell everybody else that we shouldn't only be seen as these two things, uh, the cook, the doormat, that you can walk all over and, 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 and expect to, to then cook for you after that. Um, there is more to it. There is more to this woman that just wears an apron and when they're wearing the apron, they're then scrubbing the floors. So it was, it was a fun, yeah, I think after doing those three and then having to hear what people were saying about uh, those aprons, I then was inspired to carry, to carry on making seven more. And I, I tell you, I, I only own, I now own, I still have two with me. The rest, I no longer have them because I think the ones that came to say I would like to buy them were, were understood what I was trying to, to, to say. 
that you, you're not only the cook and the doormat, there is more about you than just those two things. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Hola. Yeah. Um, uh, can you tell us about um, your Genesis series and what um, origination ideas um, mean for you, particularly in light of the fact that um, you know your work has such a mishmash of cultural references? Yeah, um, the Genesis series. Okay, yeah, it's like again, I'm using. I have this thing where I, I have um, <clears throat> uh, like, um, like a task or a restrict, like a method behind the, <clears throat> these paintings. And this time it was the story of creation in the Old Testament. Um, and there was also this um, old Icelandic medieval drawings <clears throat> from uh, um, the 14th century. Mm, that were considered to be purely Icelandic, but the f and they were like drawings, and it was kind of illustrations of um, of um, uh, like biblical illustrations. And uh, but then when you looked close closer at these drawings, they were actually copies of uh, drawings um, similar from Europe at the at that time. So like from uh, from Holland and. And Germany. So what was really Icelandic in those drawings, but the drawings, they're just kind of little drawings of, of like Jesus, um, um, Mary holding the baby Jesus. And then there was also um, this um, uh, story of creation, the, the seventh day when, like, yeah, when God is supposed to be, have created the world. And so these paintings are kind of the references be behind the paintings are these drawings, but also there, there, there's like a mix of um, there's my own personal history in it. Um, so, um, for instance, there is um, there's a falcon in one painting, and that's fifth day when when the fishes and um, the birds were created. But this falcon is like uh, another kind of like dream I had when I was in my uh, when when I was in like my teens and um, so this thing with with um, revisiting kind of um, you know events in in uh, in childhood and teens and um, and then there are yeah and then it's just a mix um, there is um there is like uh, this frames you see in all the paintings. They are coming from these Icelandic drawings. And then I, I uh, made like an interpretation or um, inspiration of the, the pattern of the Endebele people in, in South Africa. And this was because I was, became very interested in this. My, my, my husband is writing his PhD on these uh, murals and beadworks. And, um, the reason why I, I started to look at them was just I wanted to to understand them, and I think like to understand something for me it works to actually look at it and and copy it, or or to make a drawing, make make a sketch out of it. So that was my like I I, I was trying to understand it. So that's so is this what you mean by thinking through painting? Yeah. Yeah, but also when I'm talking about thinking through painting, it's also a way to um, actually to kind of like uh, to clear the clutter out of my head, <laughs> to, to come into this like, to come into a space of being just focused. And I, I mean, I can really relate to what Gina is talking about when it comes to knitting and, you know, it's like you come to a place where you are just focused on the details and um, and it's really not any longer about when I'm painting it's not any longer about that I'm painting a like a, a mouth or a waterfall or it's it's just about the colors and it's about it's it's um, yeah it's about the colors and it's about the brush brush strokes so and it's just a very very 
nice place to be in like it's it's like it actually it clears my thinking and it um makes um um makes me more like focused and it's just takes something when i've been spending like hours painting in my studio i continue in this like space throughout the rest of the day so so yeah that's how i see like that's how i'm thinking through painting it's just like the thinking becomes more clear somehow or not clear or i don't, I don't know how to explain it um, that's a nice statement thinking through painting actually mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i mean i don't know about how you uh, about feeling but i mean it is just this with this whole covid uh, thing starting and i just found i just find that i've I've had this need to work with my hands and to feel mm. connected from the first day of lockdown. Um, the first thing that I did was I went and I started, uh, I, I planted vegetables um, and I plant, started planting a, a vegetable garden, um, which I've been meaning to do for the last six months and I haven't had a chance to do so in our new house. But just this need to connect with earth again through all this craziness. Um, yeah. has just been a real need um, and so I mean I just wanted to ask you basically the last two questions to kind of wrap up this conversation um, and the first of those questions uh, is you know uh, the work that you were doing at the bag factory when this COVID crisis interrupted things because um, you know doing a digital residency is one thing and you know Erla you've done digital works before um, but it doesn't necessarily mean to just translate things to the digital is just so easy and because if you're in one mind space and now to move back into another mind space it's not that easy um, and the second question is um, I don't know if both of you are full-time artists um, what 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 are the real um what is the real impact that the the covid crisis is going to have on your careers going forward mm. Mm. yeah I should, uh, I should. <laughs> you start ella because okay. there is the first question for you yeah then, yeah um yeah like i was at the back factory and i was working towards an exhibition uh, uh, that i was going to have in sweden so i was just uh, making all these new works there at the back factory which was really like i had it was great to work there and yeah and then this kind of just happened very quickly so with the co i mean i remember a week before we we left we left on the 22nd of march from mm. from johannesburg to to yeah. berlin it was like i wasn't really bothered about it. i think i don't think anyone was really bothered it just happened so quickly and um and then you know we we arrive here in berlin and it's just like we're coming into a void you you can't go any we were like in a quarantine almost for two weeks of course we could go out and do some shops and groceries but like had to you know keep the social distance and all that and it was a bit you know very strange it was extremely strange times and just not really understanding what's going on and i think um what i miss is just you know to to see people to meet to be kind of <laughs> to uh, be close, you know, to, um, yeah, to be, to, to, to have, you know, to have dinner parties, to, to hang out with people, like more just than one person for a walk and you have to keep your distance. It would be, yeah. And then, uh, but it doesn't, I mean, I, I'm still just, uh, the work in the studio is, is, is because I'm doing that alone. So that's fine. And what's really fort good here, I have to say, I'm I'm so happy for the German government giving artists money in these times because um, yeah. I mean I lost a lot of like the, I mean I was getting, gonna get paid for for this exhibition I had in Sweden. It's a lot of things that I I had you know I I kind of got got bankrupt there and. And then now the German uh, government is actually supporting all self-employed 
the artist with the tax number you get mm. you get like a like a nice sum of money so you can survive and if i if we wouldn't have get gotten that here i don't know what I, where i'd been so yeah so this is yeah. you know this is like germany wow you know I, i'm angela yeah. merkel <laughs> So <laughs> it's a true, real support when it comes to um, artists, not only, I mean, every kind of artist that writers and uh, musicians and yeah, so. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, I think, I think this is, it, I mean, there are some things that crystallizes in these times, for instance, if you're home a lot or if you're like, for instance, I would like, you know, there are things that I see more clearly in the home, in the studio. And I think it's, it's, it's painful, but it's good. It's like it's going to lead to something. And I'm in much more, I'm in a daily contact with my mother. I'm in contact with like friends that I haven't really talked to for a long time. You know, so it's it's interesting. It's like it does something to you, uh, which which I hope is gonna lead to some good things. But it's yeah, we have no idea what's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah. I think I I I, I agree with the last part that we really don't know what is going to happen. Um, everything now hangs in the balance. Uh, everything remains so uncertain. I also had. Uh, was looking forward to uh, certain exhibitions. And when everything started blowing up, you start receiving so many uh, um, emails to say, we have postponed, we have postponed, mm -hmm. we have postponed. So, but does that stop you from working? No, it doesn't. It continues to, it doesn't inspire you for sure. Um, but it doesn't stop you from from continuing to to produce the works because whatever it is that it that you wanted to say still remains um you still have that uh, burning idea or that burning thing that you needed to solve by creating that particular artwork and you still have to soldier on and to carry on doing that um unfortunately in my country we are not we are not um well, they did um, advertise that we should hand in our names and particular event that has been cancelled and postponed. But look, my event was happening in Europe, and how is how does the how do I justify that I wanted to that I should receive this kind of grant from my own government when it was supposed to be happening um, in Europe? So. We'll have to see what, what happens. But I believe there are some artists that have applied for that grant and they probably are already receiving it or not. Um, I'm also quite grateful uh, for many other things that continue to happen around me. Uh, I receive a lot of support from um, my own husband, from the children. Um, and I think we, we, we're okay. I think we, we're okay. We'll just have to wait and take, and see. Yeah. Take your blessings where you can. Yes, that's true. I am quite grateful. <laughs> <laughs> I am grateful. Yeah. Um, so I need to ask Candice if there are any questions. Candice? Hi. Hi. Are there any questions that we need to field? There was there were two comments, one for for Erla and one for Georgina. I don't know if they're questions um, so much as Erla. The comment was, it's interesting to see how unadorned your self-portraits are. Um, and for Gina, it was, I love the way you have taken a mundane task like knitting and turned it into art. <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you whoever you are thank you <laughs> yeah. yeah thanks is there anything else that either of you wants to say to your adoring audience <laughs> <laughs> oh um uh i think let me start and say for me it's i i i i i didn't really think um 
what I was doing and, and hiding underneath the bed. It's, it's a term that I always have coined that I'd been doing all these works and hiding them underneath the bed. I didn't think that they would actually be understood by so many other people. I also did not imagine the number of people that find it, that's actually not find it, but actually understand it. I, I just thought it was just for me. I didn't realize it can be shared to, to so many people. So I say thank you to everyone, actually. Mm. So, um, Lam, any last words? Yeah, I mean, um, thanks, Gina. This was inspiring. Uh, you know, I can relate to that because for me, it was like my my hidden passion. Like I, I just wanted to paint. You know, that was just a, what I wanted to do. And and then I find myself. I mean, that from the beginning, I, you know, I just wanted to do that. And then I find myself to actually be able to exhibit and to live on it and that's mm -hmm. just really something and and you know um of course once can you know if i would have a bigger studio if a blah 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 but that's what what you know with age i've learned to just you know be grateful you i'm just i just feel incredibly grateful that i actually uh, you know i'm here and uh, talking to you guys and sharing this you know hearing your thoughts sharing this uh, my you know my my thoughts about my my works and um i just think it's incredibly important for i'm thinking of like young people how you know to to just really if you want to make art make art you know there yeah. will, there will always be a way you can always find a way i don't know I mean, I'm not, I'm not coming from like a super rich back, you know, I just did it somehow, you know, and, um, and um, I think there's so much we can do just by dreaming and with, you know, just by allowing to, to dream. Um, mm. That's, that's, I, I believe in that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> Well, I have to say thank you very much uh, for this fantastic conversation. Um, Georgina, it's just a real honor to speak to you, especially, you know, it's um, especially, you know, you're part of a, a, a generation that's really, you know, redefining what uh, Zimbabwean art is in the last, you know, decade. And so um, it's really fantastic to be able to, to speak to you. Um, Elda, and, and, and I hope on, on, you know, on another occasion, maybe that e either if you find yourself back in Johannesburg, we get to meet mm. face to face, uh, Andreas That would be well. good. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, and thank you very much uh, to Candice and the Bag Factory for this opportunity to speak to both of you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. All the best. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Thank Thanks. you everyone so much for your time and for this very engaging conversation. I really enjoyed listening. Thank, Thank you, Candice. Thank you, Candice. All the best, everyone. Stay safe. Yeah. Thank you, Charlene. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.